now we come to data analysis part and uh, of course data analysis can take a full course of six months so what i'll try to do is to give you a basic idea here again not going into too many details but to give you the basic steps in data analysis first of course is the data quality control and modification so you first uh, the data that comes as a raw reads in the form of past q files and then you have to check whether your past q files the quality is right or not so normally there are certain programs that are available for example you can do a fast qc which is the most common method of doing quality control fast qc will generate a lot of graphs that will tell you whether your reads are good quality or not so it will give you a you know the read quality at each position then it will also give you the gc content and so on and so forth and it will also show you what a good graph would be like so you can have your corrections based on that you could do certain modifications the most common modification is the removal of adapter sequences which may be a contamination the other thing is many a times as a machine artifact the five prime and the three prime and the sequences are not so exact so those five or ten base pairs can be taken away and that allows you for a neat good quality data from there on then once you have done this the next step is to map the map the uh, the sequence to most commonly to a reference right or in case you're doing a uh, uh, you know, de novo assembly, then also you are basically mapping them against each other to find unique overlaps. Uh, and you could align them to a reference. Most commonly, if it is Illumina, you'd be doing a alignment to reference. If it is long reads, you could do a de novo assembly. So you one versus all, all versus all comparisons and looking for unique overlaps. And then beyond this point, you, depending on what is the objective of the experiment, the pipeline may be different. If you're doing uh, variation analysis, you'll look for variant calling so you'll follow the vcf pathway if you are doing your transcriptome so you would want to you know first identify exon intron boundaries assemble your full transcript together and then quantify how much of each is for each gene is present if you want to if you're looking at uh, you know dna protein interaction so you would have your small fragments of dna to which your protein had bound and you would look for again quantify how much of each type of sequence is present if you're looking for epigenetic states again you will quantify for each region, how much of the cytosin of a given, you know, for each position, how much of a given number of cytosins are methylated or not. If you're looking at chromatin uh, states, again, you'll use attack sec. Uh, so these are the five major uh, sequencing uh, uh, applications that are the follow up of the initial sequencing that you give uh, DNA sec, RNA sec, chip sec, BS sec, and attack sec. And there are the, several other. Uh, slighter modifications but these are the main main ones main type of analysis that you do and because uh, the sequencing data is high throughput a manual analysis is not possible so therefore uh, you know the importance is of you know using the programs that are available and because programs can read only when the data is presented in a specific manner or format so therefore ngs data analysis involves a lot of formats right to begin with we'll discuss a few formats here the most common format is basically your sequence format. So you have the fastq format, which is the standard format for representing sequence data here. So four line format for sequencing data includes quality scores. Um, that is why it is called fastq because it also contains quality scores. So I'll give you more details of this as we move along. Alignment file, SAM and BAM format. I uh, will not talk of much details of this. And then you have annotation, which is GFF3 and DTF format. And then you have intervals format or the bed format. Uh, some of this we will not be able to discuss today for lack of time, but of course uh, we can go ahead and see how much we can cover, right? And the lecture will extend a little, maybe 10 or 15 minutes extra. We'll see. So here you are. This is your fast queue format. Uh, fast queue format is a standard sequence format that you have in NGS, in NGS data. Now, if you look at this, this is one sequence is represented by four lines. The first is the identifier line. This is a unique identifier for each sequence. So if there are 10,000 sequences in your file, each one will have a unique uh, identifier in the first line. This begins with the other rate sign, followed by some encoding that gives it the uniqueness. Then the second line is the sequence line, the actual nucleotides identified at each position. Then the third line is, uh, begins with the plus sign, and sometimes it would be just having the plus sign, nothing else. And at other cases, it would have the identifier again, uh, following up the plus sign. The fourth line is the quality scores line. This is basically to uh, to basically, you know, indicate what is the quality of the individual nucleotide that you're calling at each position. And this is as sky encoded, so you do not see the actual numerical values, but it can be translated into numerical values later on. For example, here, this uh, 
uh, rectangular bracket to uh, the, the second one basically represents the uh, uh, spread quality of 29. So what is spread quality? We'll talk of that as we move along. So FRED is a program that assigns quality scores to each nucleotide call in a sequence. FRED scores are logarithmically related to probability of error. So Q is the FRED score. It is basically minus 10 log of the P, right? So a FRED score of zero means the probability of uh, error is one, right? So this is your zero, a probability of error is one. A FRED score of 10 means the probability of error is 0 0.1. So this is the probability of error P, right? A FRED score of 20 is probability of 0 0.01 error. A FRED score of 40 is probability of 0 0.001. So usually we have a range of 0 to 40 for FRED quality scores. Anything above 20, 20 is acceptable. Anything below 20 is not so acceptable, right? So this is uh, what is in, in brief about the FRED scores. So the first thing that you do once you get your data is what is known as the quality control. And the most common uh, algorithm that we use for quality control is the fast QC and fast QC the top uh, the first graph that you get in fast QC is this so here you are this is the quality scores across all bases Sanger Illuminari this is basically what you see here the quality score for the first position second position third position fifth position and then beyond a certain point it does the binning so for position 15 to 19 the cumulative quality score is now being shown here right and this is the range this is typically what is known as box plot box and whisker plot you have uh, indications of the 25th and 75th percentile and also the 10th and 90th percentile. The green region is where it is acceptable. So anything above 28 to 40 is absolutely fine. Uh, in fact, anything above 20 is also okay. Uh, if, if you have most of it in 40, a few in 28 is fine. But then if you have anything below between zero to 20, then there is a problem. If there is a major part of your sequence of here, then you'll have to, you know, trim to that part so unless your scores come up in this range. So after the fast QC report, you do the trimming so as to ensure that what you give, what you give as data to the next steps in the process are absolutely confident data. Right? Then the next step here, once you've done your trimming and everything is what is known as the alignment. And uh, there are several types of aligners that are available. You have uh, short read aligners and long read aligners. So uh, you have shorted aligners like Bowtie 2, burroughs willer algorithm aligner, a high stat 2, Mummer 4, star is for RNA alignment, top hat 2 is also for RNA alignment, fly is for long read sequencer DNA alignment. So you, depending on what is the type of data that you want and what is the type of platform that you used, you will have to select which type of aligner you're going to use. Mostly all of them will give you uh, nearly accurate results, right? Then the alignment format is also there. This is uh, 11 column string and you have several inputs here so as to ensure that you have, you know, you can go back and check how good the quality of alignment has been, right? Then we come to the revolution and uh, we talk of milestones in sequencing. So uh, if you see uh, the last to last year, Nature came up with the special issue, February, 2021. This is Nature milestone for genome sequencing because this was 20 years of the sequencing of the human genome, and you have the listings here. This is very short, so let me just give you a more uh, compact, a more readable view. So 1977, the first uh, virus was sequenced. 1982, battle for lambda was sequenced. Haemophilus influenzae, the first reliving organism, sequenced in 1995. You can see there is a whole lot of gap until 2001. And since 2001, we have started sequencing extensively, and we have sequenced literally everything that we know is mostly sequenced now or or sequencing today is not a challenge at all that is the basic uh, revolution that we have today right while the first human genome was sequenced in 10 years at 3.2 billion dollars we are today talking of uh, sequencing a human genome at 100 dollars and roughly half a day or let's say you know less than half a day so that is where our idea of precision medicine takes wings to have precision medicine as a general practice in medicine the first thing that you require is that everybody needs to get sequenced. So therefore, you know, that's the revolution that we're living in today. And uh, of course, for everything today, even for the coronavirus, you know, that the confirmatory sequence uh, test was actually sequencing. And you had some nanoports installed at airports when at the peak of the corona uh, phase, right? So I'm sure you know that. Class, you're following everyone? Yes, sir. 
Okay, so I see the attendance has been uh, stable. Nobody has left, so which is good and encouraging. I was expecting more attendance, though. That is one thing that uh, that is a bit disappointing, but it is okay. So here you are, and we have come to a point where where we can sequence a, a genome ten times larger than the human genome. So, for example, here the axolotl genome and uh, has been sequenced, which so is ten times larger than the human genome. Right. So now sequencing is no more. Uh, sequencing genome is no more of a challenge. The challenge is analyzing the data that comes after that because the data that comes is huge and uh, unless you have certain uh, you know programming skills it will not be possible to analyze that data so here you are uh, broad applications variant calling you could do a dna sec and you could identify variants uh, in an in individual genome and look for how these variations impact his wellness then you could do an epigenomic study methylation status cytosines and CAG, CAG, and CHH context in plants. So this is called bisulfide sequencing. And I've already told you, if you're using Illumina, you'll have to do a bisulfide sequencing. If you're using Nanopore or PathBio, then in that case, and long-range sequencers, the readout for epigenetic state is also automatic. You don't have to go through a special process. Then you have, when I was in Paris, I was doing this BSEC data analysis uh, roughly two years ago, just before the onset of, uh, of the pandemic. In fact, I came to India after there was a lockdown in France. Then you have the transcriptome analysis, rna -SEC data analysis, and then finally you have the protein binding to DNA, and that analysis is known as the ChIP-seq analysis. I've already also told you about ATAC-seq analysis that informs you about the chromatin state of the DNA, right? Key features of NGS that make it so important, one is the scalability. It is massively parallel sequencing, high throughput parallel processing of thousands of samples. Speed, it is quick. Whole genome in half a day now, exome in a day. A, what is exome? Exome is only the express, pa express part of the genome. So we'll come to it, what is an exome and why it is important. Then this is high resolution. I've already told you this is deep sequencing, high coverage, 100 to 150x, uh, very, uh, very routinely possible, and single base pair resolution. And then, of course, uh, because uh, you use, uh, in second generation, you use uh, uh, small reads. So mostly what you do is a reference-based assembly. Right? Coming to exome sequencing, so I told you even today, uh, a thousand dollar genome sequencing is not possible. Uh, it is almost achievable now, but not not so much. So uh, while it is still uh, exorbitantly constant, so uh, uh, I mean it is it is very expensive. So what people do alternatively is to go for what is known as exome sequencing. So you know that you know uh, only one point five percent approximately of your genome is actually coding for genes, and eighty five percent of the mutations that impact gene expression are within these genetic regions. So what you do is you are still getting 85% of your disease information by just sequencing 1.5% of the genome. So therefore, the cost of sequencing goes dramatically down here, and you're still able to get almost 85% of your disease-causing information. So therefore, uh, this is one process that is preferred. Exome sequencing, as of today, is very commonly done, right? And uh, so for exome sequencing, you need to capture from your fragmented library, you need to capture only the DNA that corresponds to genes. So therefore, you have special methods of doing that. We'll not go into details for lack of time, but I'm sure you'll be able to go through them. Then some of the Mendelian disease genes from exome or genome sequencing data that have been identified uh, using second generation sequencing, this is the list given here. Then, of course, uh, you can do a targeted panel, gene sequencing panel. So instead of, let's say you already know that these are the significant uh, mutations or important mutations for a, for a specific disease, so you could create a panel of only these mutations and do a direct sequencing of only those uh, parts and get data on how you know uh, how uh, how uh, what is the probability of your patient or or your subject getting that disease right so this is what is known as targeted gene sequencing panels focused panels contain a select set of genes or gene regions that have known or suspected association with the disease or phenotype under study gene panels can be purchased with pre-selected content or custom design to include genomic regions of interest Multiple genes can be assessed across many samples in parallel, saving time and reducing the cost associated with running uh, multiple separate assays. And what you also get here is a smaller and more manageable data and more, uh, more directed data instead of whole genome, where you get a lot of data, but you're not sure of what you're going to do with that data. So this one here, uh, based on the knowledge base, you could specifically target specific known genes. So this is more like a candidate gene approach for identifying whether the individual is susceptible to a certain or what is the what is the probability of his being susceptible to a certain disease 
then uh, I'm sure you would know about metagenomics. So metagenomics is basically studying bacterial populations as a whole. So earlier, the conventional method, if you look at, you took pond water sample. Let's say I wanted to know what is the composition of my bacterial population in the pond water sample. So I take the pond water sample. I culture it out first. This is a mixed culture. From here, I create pure culture and then characterize the bacteria. The problem here is that the moment I go for culturing, I am losing out 99% of my diversity straight away because laboratory conditions and the media that I use may not allow me to actually grow all the organisms that are present in this particular pond water sample. The alternate here is metagenomics, where this is basically an NGS-based sequencing technique, where you directly extract the entire DNA in sample, do a whole genome sequencing or a partial genome sequencing in the sense that you could only do a 16S uh, for prokaryotes or 18S for fungus and other microorganisms, and then do a molecular characterization. You match the database, identify which type of organisms are present in your metagenomic sample. So this basically gives you a very, uh, you know, a uh, very detailed idea of what could be the possible uh, components, uh, what could be the possible species present, and uh, how much of it is, you know, uh, uh, I mean, also it gives you an idea of some community structure that is there. So we'll not go into the details for now, but uh, I'm sure you'll be able to see. So you could do a 16S RDNA metagenomic sequencing, or you could do a whole genome sequencing. If you do whole genome sequencing, you would be able to identify the bacteria until the strain level or the substrain level. If you do the 16S RDNA sequencing, you would be identify you would be able to identify the bacterial population until the genus level and very comprehensively. So this is basic idea of metagenomics. There are a whole lot of metagenomics projects that are going on. You have the human microbiome project. So one idea of uh, the wellness here is that also the the bacterial population that is present in your elementary canal could also decide how well and how physically fit you are. And there is also this idea of, you know, microbiome, microbiome implantation. So people are trying to identify what is the composition of a microbiome in a healthy individual versus a diseased individual. And whether a replacement of this, uh, you know, uh, the healthy microbiome can lead to rescue of the phenotype or, or, or basically the, you know, the wellness of the individual. So these are some of the projects that are going on. You can have a look. There is also a project called Earth Microbiome Project where you're trying to catalog every single microbial species present on the earth and from, uh, you know, from all possible uh, niches. Then we've already already talked of largest genome ever sequence. This is axolotl. And this also gives us to the, gets us to the idea of uh, C-value paradox, right? C-value paradox, I'm sure you would have read. It means basically the idea is to you know, uh, the C-value paradox essentially says that, you know, the genome size does not have any correlation with the complexity of the organism. So these are axolotl salamanders, uh, axolotl larvae, and these are, uh, these have DNA 10 times larger than the human genome. Right? So this is one review you can go through, uh, and that is where I mm, picked up the title from. Also, I added my part from evolution to revolution, and that makes it very cheesy and, and, and very, uh, you know, Striking. So DNA sequencing at 40, past, present, and future is one review that you, you may refer to. I'm also writing one review on DNA sequencing techniques that would come up in the next few months. You can also have a, re a reference here. Then as I referred, we are now only in 2022, April, that we have been able to sequence the human genome absolutely completely from one, uh, from position one to position last on the chromosome. So telomere to telomere assembly, this is called. And this was done by, in 2019, Karen Mega and Adam Philippi, organized telomere to telomere assembly consortium to fill the missing pieces in the human genome. And when you did this, what is the extra amount of sequence you got? You added nearly 200 million base pairs of novel DNA sequence, including 99 genes likely to code for proteins, which are not known till date, and nearly 2,000 candidate genes that need further uh, study for and further curation to, to basically identify whether they're actually genes or not. It also corrects thousands of structural errors in the current reference sequence, the GRCS38 reference assembly. So this is as late as April 2022. And those who want to get into research must keep reading papers, right? That is important again. This is uh, the, the assembly here. This is called TT2CHM 13 version 2.0 on NCBI. You can have a look at this, right? And then, of course, uh, maybe for lack of time, I will skip this part, except that I'll give you an idea of what this means. So basic idea is if you look at the, you know, 
if you look at the conventional method of giving the medicine, the idea is that uh, irrespective of whatever the genotype individual has, you give the same amount of medicine to everyone. One dose in the morning, one dose in the afternoon, one dose in the evening. Now, based on the mutations that the person carries, uh, the same amount of dose may be effective in some individuals and may be actually toxic to other individuals. So therefore, uh, in personalized medicine, one idea is also is to look at the genome and based on the variation that the individual is carrying, you need to modulate the dosage that is given to the individual, right? And here is the reference. You can go back and look at the reference of this paper. And this is the reference here. And uh, for lack of time, I'm not covering this for now, but you can always go back and check. What lies ahead? We are moving into the era of pan genome. So this would be basically now that multiple individuals have sequenced in multiple countries and there is a whole lot of sequence information available, the reference human genome will be replaced by what is known as the pan genome. Pan genome would be a combination of multiple sequences put together and multiple vari variation information put together and also the impact of those variations in this local subpopulation. So that is where we are heading and that should basically be the beginning point now for our next uh, series of uh, precision medicine and other experiments. The desired skill set. So now that you, we have come to the last, uh, let me just give you the desired skill set. NGS data type is typically big data and requires computational data analytics skills. You need to know one programming language. Python is preferred now because Python is the base now. And you should also have uh, good statistical knowledge. So you must be, uh, you should know R. R is free, MATLAB is paid. Biostatistics is because you have a uh, huge data. You use statistics as every step to, to show that what you're taking forward is actually good quality. Then you could use some command line, you know, some scripting like awk, uh, some tools, Picard, some tools, bed tools, Bismarck, etc. You could also be familiar with Galaxy, which is an online uh, integrated development environment for NGS data analysis. And then familiarity with Linux environment would help. So this is where we end. If you want to go into some more details uh, on my YouTube channel, you could go to my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel has the same name, Dr. Wilkins Biotech and Bioinformatics Classroom. And there is a whole lot of, uh, you know, uh, talks there. You can have a look. So for example, here, there are more than six playlists now. You have a playlist on recombinant DNA technology, and there is a playlist on R. There is a playlist on tools and techniques in biotechnology, introductory bioinformatics, and so on and so forth. And go go home and have a look. Uh, I'm sure you would find it useful. There is also a, a a playlist on Python. So I'm also teaching Python. We have begun with uh, simple steps. And today, uh, I think by tonight, I will be 20,000 uh, views by tonight. So the channel is doing well. And uh, you can have a look, right? So on that note, I'll close. The channel has the same name, Dr. Wipins Biotech and Bioinformatics Classroom, right? So you can go have uh, explore the channel. If you like, you can like, you can subscribe, you can share, recommend your friends, and so on and so forth, right? So we stop here. I see some chat messages. So let me see. Uh, thank you so much, sir, right? Marvelous to everyone. Okay. And then, sir, don't you think there would be any error in human genome project during the third assembly stage as it has been? Yes, absolutely. So that is why we're moving to the pan genome stage. And I've already told you that uh, with the telomere to telomere assembly, we have, you know, identified certain errors. A structural alert more so, and that have been corrected. So, Kruti, I think uh, that is the answer to your question. Uh, okay, so there's only one question. Anybody else who wants to ask a question, you have another two minutes for that, right? Uh, else we'll close the session. Any other question, class? Sir, so, uh, yeah. first of all, I would like to thank you, sir, so much for such an enriching talk. I also got to learn so much about NGS today, and I had heard about um, a few things, but, you know, you explained it in such a great manner. Thank you so much, sir. And yeah, about yeah. participation also, I would like to say that, you know, sometimes the time zone becomes an issue because I had some participants join at around 6.50. But then they had to uh -huh. go because the session was late. But we have people that ask us for the recording. And we also share it over our YouTube, um, where we have like around 12K um, subscribers. Uh -huh. So, yeah. yeah so, yeah. thank you so much, sir. And I had a few I questions. I have a few questions here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Sir, I also had a few uh, questions that came up to me in the personal uh, message. You can uh, firstly uh -huh. go through Marvelous question and then I can... Um, like quickly okay. go through. So, so Marvelous asks, what are the prerequisites to get into metagenomics for someone with no background in comics? 
So uh, the prerequisite uh, to get into metagenomics would be, you know, to uh, first understand the basic concepts of genomics, right? Uh, also understand what is the 16S RNA and how is it used as a marker and how you can use the whole genome sequencing. And plus also, you know, uh, a programming background would help. So as I said, prerequisites would include uh, a, a bit of knowledge of Python, a bit of knowledge of R, and if that is not possible, then definitely you have to be conversant with Galaxy or Taverna, which are the workflow pipelines for non-programmers. Uh, but it is always good to know programming. That would that would be basically this. Uh, no problem, Nokia, no problem. So maybe if it is recorded, you can have the... Uh, thank you, Kruti. Thank you so much, right? Thank <laughs> Sir, you so much. I would like to ask you... Um... Two yeah. questions quickly, uh, which yeah. was sent to me. So one of it was that DNA sequencing has transformed the field of forensic science. In your perspective, right. have we reached the maximum potential of this technology or where do you see the future of DNA sequencing headed in forensic science? Oh, well, so uh, as you know, in forensic science, uh, up till now, the basic uh, gold standard was DNA fingerprinting, right? So you looked at specific regions, in the VNTRs and other regions where you could develop a fingerprint and that could basically help you implicate, you know, who is the perpetrator of the crime or let's say a species identification. So you could do a P450 amplification, identify up to the species level. Let's say you have confiscated some bones and you want to know if this bone is coming from human or from, you know, animal. So, which is uh, the most common type of cases that you generally get. So that would, could be done. And now, of course, uh, everything is going through this sequencing. So I already told you that the, in the in the initial part that there is a new thing now that uh, sequence is the new microscope. So once you sequence something, you are absolutely sure that there, there is no iota of, of of doubt about you know that uh, what is the what is the belonging of the sequence uh, to. I, I mean which species or which individual does it belong to, uh, there is very little doubt in that. So I think that will be the ultimate of uh, DNA uh, in forensics is to do DNA sequencing and then uh, unambiguously identify whatever your sample is or whatever your case is. So I guess yes, we are very good. And the plummeting cost of sequencing, so initially the why uh, we used to go for southern non-hybridization or those kind of tests or PCR amplification test was because those were cheaper than sequencing. Now that the sequencing cost is coming down and it is uh, absolute unambiguous, uh, you know, uh, explanation. And even when you did PCR amplification for DNA fingerprinting, at the end of it, as a confirmation, you also did sequencing. So therefore now uh, sequencing could be a straight away first answer, right? So that is, uh, I, I would suggest that, you know, everything is now boiling down to sequencing. And the cost that has come down, I'm sure you know of the law where, you know, it is said that the cost of, uh, transistors would come down to half and, and the capacity would go by double and uh, Moore's law that is. Sequencing costs have beaten Moore's law by, by miles. So therefore it becomes very important. And how can you assist someone who wants to build up skills in bioinformatics? Well, assisting someone in building bioinformatics, you can check my uh, YouTube blogs there. And there is one that is talking about introduction to bioinformatics, one thing. So basic bioinformatics is web-based bioinformatics that we do. Uh, some of the basic analysis you can do with base. Then also I have a, a channel on, I have a, a playlist on R programming and I have a playlist on Python programming, which is mostly for bioinformaticians uh, with some basic uh, data analysis. So you could go there and check that. I hope that will be helpful. And then in case you have some individual questions, you can always come back to me and ask me, right? I'm available 24 seven. So no time zone issues here, right? So you can always come back. My email is given. You can check my email and get back to me at any point of time, right? Yeah. Recently, I had given a talk in Africa that was with uh, one group there and I had a few attendants there, right? You're most welcome, Eric Mavanke, right? And everybody else. So Kruti is asking uh, that if you have any internship opportunities in your working field. Uh, not in our university as of now, but uh, we'll see if, if it is available, it will be advertised. I'm very active on social media, on LinkedIn, other things. Ayushi knows, right? So, yes, so if there is, uh, <laughs> so, uh, okay, so I'll give you the mail here. It is the pin dot thing dot cu at gmail.com, right? And you could go to uh, Google and type Vipin's e-classroom, right? You could type Vipin's e-classroom. It will take you to my website. You will have my information there as well. 
V I T I N Griffin E C L A S S. That will take you to my website. Also, it will give you the idea of where my YouTube channel is. And um, just type on Google, and the first it would be my website. You can just check that. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Just the last one. Uh, are there any freely available NGS analysis tools or softwares? Yes, yes. Everything is freely available. NGS analysis is very democratized, right? So the tools are freely available. So like FastQC, just type on Google and you'll be able to download it, right? And it is it is a Linux-based, uh, unless you're doing web-based, uh, you will have to be into a Linux environment. Everything is freely available. There is nothing that is, you know, uh, uh, paid. Um, for more, and, and even if there are some paid softwares, there is always a counterpart uh, uh, where which is freely available. For example, again, like R and MATLAB. So MATLAB can also help you do a statistical analysis like R. But MATLAB is paid, but R as a as a framework is freely available, right? And then everything is available also on Galaxy. And not one tool. There are multiple tools that are available. You all you need to do is to explore a bit, and you'd be able to you know find a tool that suits your requirement. For example, if I if you remember, I showed you Bowtie, I showed you Red Hat, I showed you Top Hat, not Red Hat, Top Hat. I showed you Fly. So these are all aligners that are available freely. So most of the data analytics that you do with NGS is freely available. Should not be a problem with that. All right. Thank you so much, sir, once again for joining with us today and for such such an enriching talk. It was really great to have you. And oh, Ayushu, is, yes, also sir. send me the send me the recording, huh? Yes, sir. I'll surely send you the recording. Thank and so we will also like uh, for the participants, because when we shared about your session, I had so many emails and messages regarding it. Huh. So we will be sharing it with them also if they'll be asking about the session in case they've missed it. And yeah, they no will... problem. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. you're welcome, Ash.